Hello and welcome to the Haughty Culturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas and we do post every week, do we not Stephen? We certainly do, so join in. Hit the subscribe button and do follow our continuing adventures. And this week I am particularly excited, although I am excited <laughs> every week. Stephen, Good. Because we are going to visit something that is one of your many specialties. <laughs> if you might remember viewers, we have done a masterclass of Stephen Ryan taking cuttings and propagating plants from cuttings. Well today it's about growing plants from seed exactly and there's oodles of things to learn about growing plants from seed let me tell you there yeah. is because yeah. I have I would say a 20% success rate so yeah. I am keen yeah to all right out everything and I should preface this whole thing with all we can give you are basic principles and ideas on how to deal with certain groups of plants yeah experimenting is still going to be the way that you may well have to go with very specific requirements so yeah. you need to sort of take a, a sort of a an overall view of what we're doing and perhaps adapt some of the techniques to your own needs and to the type of plant you're raising yep but we can do some general principles and yep. i guess the first question though before we dive in mm. is your uh, commercial nursery here yeah how much of your material do you propagate from seed Look, there's a reasonable percentage. I don't know exactly how much, but I would guess at around about 20 to 30 percent of the plants I grow, I do raise from seed. That's quite a lot. Yeah. So quite labor intensive. Yes, but it is also quite economical to raise plants from seed, far mm. more so than cuttings and many of the other techniques you can propagate plants from. Yep. The upside is you can get a lot of plants in a very small space fairly quickly. Yep. Uh, the downside is, of course, that genetics can step in, so you can't always be 100% certain of what you're raising. Who was your seed. mother? Who was your father? Yeah. Well, exactly. But that also can have its bonuses because if you raise things from seed, you never know, you might find that new variety of something that you call Matthew. You Lucas later on or the black oxalis that <laughs> is gonna you know make your fortune exactly <laughs> so on that point do you harvest your seeds or do you buy seeds uh, in mm. and given that you're a specialist of rare plants do you import seeds from overseas because mm. Australia has such strict um, bio regulations yeah. about importing live materials All so right. tell us about that it's a bit of everything I do collect a lot of my own seed yeah uh, because in some cases it's the only source I've got to in fact have seed of some plants yeah so yes I collect a fair bit of my own seed if I'm bringing seed in from overseas then I have to buy it through commercial sources it has to come in a proper printed packet with the name of the plant printed on the front and it needs to come from a recognized source yeah. because of course if I was to bring seed in from overseas I don't know, from my auntie in, in Slovakia or somewhere, she could put anything on the outside of the envelope. So mm -hmm. it has to come from a recognized seed source. And of course it has to be seed that is on the allowed list to start with. Mm. So it's got to be allowed species that are coming in. And there is a naughty species list in Australia of seeds you can't import. Yes, uh, in fact, it sort of, it started out with uh, a list of things you can't import. It's actually got almost the opposite way around now where they have what they call their icons list. And you go into icons and it gives you a list of the things that are allowed. Mm. If they're not on the icons list and you still want to bring it in, then you have to make application, get it assessed. Uh, and if it could go through the system of an emu and come out the other side as a viable seed, it may not get permission to come in. Uh, I've gone through the process of the icons with list. With the emu. Uh, with, well, basically the emu. It's 14 pages long. And if you answer, I don't know on anything, that's a tick against the plant that you're trying to bring in. Mm. So it's quite quite detailed and quite difficult to do mm. if you're trying to get a new plant onto the icons list. Mm. So it can be quite difficult, but generally speaking, most of the plants I'm growing, I'm raising from seed that I've collected myself or that friends have collected off their plants mm. for me to grow. Mm. And that's how I, I get the plants to go. And of course, the plant importation is even more difficult because of course, bringing in live plant material, mm. they have to go through a quarantining phase, mm. which takes at least three months. Mm. Uh, and it's not just about the plants potentially becoming a feral pest mm. but there's also the possibility of something piggybacking in with that plant mm. so we might end up with a new viral disease a new mm. fungus disease mm. or even dare I say an insect that's sort of piggybacks in that we don't want in this country so it's important there you go so seeds mm. important to your business yes they are important to my business and over the years I've learned a few little quick techniques that make things a little easier uh, and uh, I've also sort of 
I don't know, I've acquired knowledge through other people as well, and mm. that's the way we manage these things. But everything has to be adapted to your own conditions once you start. So I have to say, if you've got three seeds of something to raise, <laughs> then you've got an issue because you can't be too experimental. But if you have a number of seeds that you've collected yourself or have come into your possession, mm. then if it's something you've never grown before, I'd be a little experimental. Try out a few different ways mm. of pre-preparing your seed, of sowing your seed, timing your seed. Yep. There's a whole range of different things you could look at mm. uh, if you can't find the specific information you need on that particular plant. All right, well, I think without further ado, we should dive in and start looking at your hot tips for seed propagation. <laughs> what a good idea. Now, Stephen, there are many seeds in the world. Yes. So what should you be looking for when you're collecting them? How do you look after the seeds once you've picked it? All right. The first thing to realize is that most seeds should be picked when it's fully ripe on the plant. So don't pick seed when it's too immature because that will have an impact on most things viability. There are exceptions to everything I say today. So just keep in mind that that might not work for everything. But generally speaking, I like to let the seed get as ripe as possible for the plant. If it's starting to look like it's about to fall off, that's probably when you should start collecting it. And then you need to look at what sort of seed you're collecting. And we have a few of the different possibilities here. And by the magic of technology, we are going to come and have a look. So here we have a sort of a dryish seed with no sort of extraneous material attached to it. This is actually seed of ferula, uh, the giant fennel. That seed doesn't have fruit around it or anything like that. It's just a dry seed and it's a nice size, so it's easy to handle and to see and to know what to do with. We also have seeds that have uh, appendages. And here I've got some seed off one of the species Clematis. So this is Clematis viora, and it has these funny feather-like extensions on the seed. Now, a lot of books will tell you that you should remove the appendages before you sow, so that you don't have those appendages rotting away in the uh, seed bed that then could bring rot into the seed. I have to say, I think it's rot. But there you go. Uh, and so I would not hesitate to sow this seed, in fact, as is. I would leave it intact and just go with that. The same would be said of maple seed. I'm going to shoot over this way a little bit. Here I've got seeds of an extremely rare maple. This is Acer pentaphyllum from China. There's apparently less than a couple of hundred of them in the wild. Actually, we've probably got enough there to almost make the wild population. And it has a wing-like appendage to the seed. Now, if you've got more, than, more time than you know what to do with, you could go and pluck them off. But otherwise, I would leave them attached to the seed. So they're not going to cause any grief at all. And finally, we've got some berries. Now, berries being soft, squishy fruits, they can cause all sorts of other issues and certainly are not that easy to store because they will go moldy in a container and so therefore you've got an issue with them. You might want to clean them if you're going to store them. But funnily enough, with berries, I generally sow in the autumn, early winter, as soon as I've collected them and I just let the pulp rot off them in the potting mix and it doesn't seem to do any harm. What was that beautiful purple berry? Oh, that beautiful pepper berry was, funnily enough, commonly called a beauty berry and botanically Calicarpa, Calicarpa geraldii, uh, charming shrub. Ch charming, it's charming, 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 charming. charming. Yes. All right, so you mentioned collecting the seeds. Yeah. How do you store them? So you said the best time to collect them is when they look as though they're about to drop. Yeah. Um, could you sow them immediately or not? Uh huh. well, in the vast majority of cases, I do so immediately. Okay. So I don't generally store seed. If seed comes to me from an overseas seed exchange, it's probably been in storage for a fair while anyway. Mm. So I'm not sure how long the viability of some seeds would be. So I tend to sow them straight away. Yep. If I collect my own, I'll put them into something to take them to the nursery or whatever. So they'll go into a brown paper bag or a brown paper envelope. Yep. And sometimes I recycle them, as you can tell. Not plastic. No, keep them out of plastic because if there's any moisture there, it will tend to start rotting them. This is what I did. I yeah. collected some seeds from a friend of something that actually I gave her and turned out to be much more interesting than I thought it would be. <laughs> oh, damn. So collect your seed, put it in a plastic bag, meaning to transfer it into a paper yeah. bag and forgot. Uh -oh. Last week I went to have a look and thought, oh, it had all just... Yeah, it does. It goes mouldy. Mouldy and rotted. And of course, things like berries, which we talked about a second ago, 
unless you're going to clean all of the berry off and dry the seed out for storage mm. then almost invariably anything with a berry i sow as soon as i collect it or within a day or so yeah. and try and get that sort of out into the uh, shade house properly sown as quickly as possible which brings us which you kind of answered to when is the best time to sow seed so if a plant has produced seed and it's ready to fall mm. you would assume in the wild it that's, would fall. <laughs> it would fall. Yeah, exactly. It would be sown. Yeah. So really, that's the time to yeah. sow it. A lot of things, particularly in cooler climates, what happens is you've got a, a canopy of deciduous trees. Yeah. You'll have herbaceous things growing under the trees, and you'll have the trees themselves setting seed. Yeah. What tends to happen, most seeds ripen just before leaf fall. So the l seed will ripen, it will drop to the ground almost immediately afterwards. And this goes for the understory plants as well as the tree. It's the covered tr by the a layer of mulch. Yeah, the leaves will drop off the tree and cover the, the seeds. Goodness. Now in some climates, those seeds will sit underneath that mulch mm. in a cooler climate, going through a winter, perhaps with snow and all those other things. Mm. And in the meantime, the seeds are actually ripening and getting ready for an immediate germination when the warm weather sets up sets in in the spring mm. they've already been covered over so they're protected a little bit from rodents and other things that might be out there looking to feed off them yeah um and so what i try and do when i'm collecting seed is basically simulate what nature would do so yeah. yes i would take the seed home i would sow it within a very short period i would put it into my shade house where it will get whatever cold we can throw at it over the winter mm. which seems to be enough to ripen most cold climate seeds mm. so the only seeds i would really store and hold on to until such time as i would then sow them in the spring yeah. would be things that are generally from warmer climates that might be slightly frost tender yeah and so i would sow those in the early spring when the cold is over logical there you go because yeah. i've often pondered that about well the seeds right now should i plant now so that's a very good point yeah so right. i would normally plant as soon as i can and right on the bag what is inside you see i wrote the name of the plant here and, here and i've done that there and i even dated that one which is actually quite a good idea as well <laughs> i haven't dated this one and i'm not quite sure how old these seeds are now so bad Stephen. it is it's naughty and so you need to be very sort of organized all right so, well there you go let us now sow some seeds all right let's look at what we need to sow them with yeah in fact all right Stephen. what do we need to sow our seeds well we need obviously containers of an appropriate size mm -hmm. now if i'm sowing annuals or vegetables or something it's a really quick crop then you might get away with using a seed tray that's fine but if it's a shrub or a, a slow growing perennial or a tree then it's going to develop quite a big root system yeah so i tend to use much deeper containers for putting those sorts of seeds into so that the root can come down without being wound around in the bottom. Yep. And you pick a container that's appropriate to the amount of seed you have to sow. Uh -huh. I mean, it sounds logical, but if you've only got two or three seeds to sow of something, then you want a comparatively small container and you'll sow them in there together. If there's something that you are re find really precious, you might in fact use small tubes and sow each individual seed in a separate tube, yep. which in fact, I have done earlier with some things that I found to be particularly precious. So this is in fact a seedling that has recently germinated. This was really precious seed and it was sown about four months ago and it's now germinated. And this is of a plant that's extinct in the wild. This is Sephora Toromiro from Easter Island. And so the seed's very precious. So I've sown each individual seed in a separate container and of course I've labeled it all very carefully so I know what I've got. So you might do that and it's a nice deep little container so the roots have got plenty of room to go down. That plant can stay in that container until it gets to quite a reasonable size. And so if you've got a lot of fine seed that's really, really fine, you would use a tray? I would use a tray or a pot depending on how much seed I've got. You need to sow your seed reasonably thinly so you need to sort of just assess how much seed you've got and what size pot is going to be appropriate and if it is going to be a fairly long-term thing in the seed raising phase then the deeper the pot the better in a way so they're they're the main things you've got to consider so and you need to have labels on which you can write all the details that you need and the dates yes in fact here i did all the right things i put the name of the plant i put the date that i sowed the seed and i've written there hot water so why did i write hot water on there i don't know Stephen. yeah well, why did you because the seed of this sephora has quite a hard seed coat so 
When I was ready to sow, the night before I dropped the seed into a coffee cup, I poured hot tap water over the top of it, and the heat of the water is dependent on how hard the seed coat is, so you might have to experiment a bit. But I just put hot tap water over it, left it sitting overnight, and then the next morning, the seeds that had swollen up by taking water in were the seeds that were ready to sow. So mm -hmm. that's what I did. How would you know if a seed had to be soaked in warm water? Just the hardness of the yeah, shell? Yeah, it's got a really hard seed coat or seems to have a really hard seed coat. Mm. Then I, and, and it's a sizable seed. Mm. I would try hot water. There are some things like some of our Australian native acacias where it's actually a good idea to pour briskly boiling water. Briskly boiling? Yeah, over them and then let that cool overnight. And again, the seeds that have swollen up will have taken in moisture, they will be the seeds that are ready to germinate. Uh -huh. So that's the details that I put on that particular label. So I know that it worked. I then know that I redo that again the next time I want to raise some Sephora Toromiro from seed. So there you go. All right, so we've covered what you need in the seeds, we've collected them. So the million dollar question, and this I think is where I have stumbled. Yeah. What mix do you use? All right. Do you have your own secret mix the Stephen no, Ryan mega mix I don't have a Stephen Ryan mega mix what I have is my general potting mix and I use that virtually for all seed as well so hang on the same potting mix you use for potting yeah exactly that's so, why it's called a potting mix <laughs> so I have bought out of the bag seed raising mix yeah which is dare I say contentiously you can is a waste of money <gasps> it could be fine for raising your vegetable seedlings or anything that's a very quick turnover crop so something that you're going to raise it's going to be germinated in a week or 10 days it's then going to go on into the garden very quickly can i just say the steam that you can see we're not in a sauna we're actually in stephen's propagating igloo and that's the steam from yeah, the from my fogging machine from the from fogging my cutting. Machine. so anyway yes, it's yeah. wonderful for the complexion. it is it is i'm yeah. feeling hydrated <laughs> so uh, I do not use seed raising mix. I use my general potting mix for raising my seed in mm. because most of my tree and shrub seed is going mm. to stay in that mix for six to 12 months or even potentially longer, depending mm. on what it is. Mm. So you need something that's a bit gutsy. And seed raising mix is no good for no, growing things in long term. Right. Uh, I think that could have been one of my mistakes. Now, talking of, of long term, I think now's the time to talk about time. So you mentioned quick turnover things so things like vegetable lettuces oh. tomatoes whatever germinate really quickly beans yep. within 10 days and in fact funnily enough on. most edible crops would not be edible crops if they weren't quick and easy to germinate in the first place when you think about it mm, that you does know, make logical you sense. know if the seed was going to take two years to come up and then the crop wasn't going to be ready for another three years we've I, all moved on or died of hunger yeah well exactly so most vegetable crops are really quick but I have, sometimes when I bought seed, they have said on the packet, be patient yeah. and don't throw it away if it hasn't germinated in 12 months. So what is your take on that, on time? Right. Is it totally species dependent? It is very species dependent. So it depends on what you're raising as to how long it's going to take. Yep. And some things just take an awful lot of time. And so, how long is an awful lot of time? Well, let's, for instance, say... Yes, I, exhibit A. It, now, if you look really closely in there, you can see some little yellowy leaves dying off. Yeah. Now, this is a plant that's getting ready to go into dormancy. So all those little yellowy green leaves there. Now, this is Paris polyphylla, which mm -hmm. is a fairly rare Asian woodland plant. Yeah. And I sowed the Paris polyphylla on the 3rd of the 4th, 2000. Over two years ago. Over two years ago. That was before we started our YouTube channel, Stephen. Yeah, yeah. So those seeds or seedlings are older than our YouTube channel. And I've got a code there. Now, the code there's JF, and you might wonder what that is. Yes. That's who I got it from. Oh, so thank you, uh, JF. Yes, so I will often put some sort of uh, uh, abbreviation on the label so that I know where the things came from, so that if I want more or whatever, or if I need to go back to the source and say, by the way, whatever it was you gave me, what didn't turn out to be what it was meant to be, mm. I can tell off the person who gave me the seed. So there you go. So you were where would you put that for two years and how long would you leave a pot thinking oh i'm going to give it a bit more of a go all right well it's very dependent on how precious the plants are that yep. you might get from the batch i have actually had seeds germinate four and five years after they were sown oh my goodness uh, so i tend to find a quiet area of my shade house where i can leave things undisturbed for a long long time and each season i'll go in and recheck and see whether there's been any obvious germination or whatever mm. um, i mean some things you know inherently need to 
germinate fairly quickly. So yep. there are some things you wouldn't bother with if they don't come up reasonably quickly. Mm. You know, if you're sowing, I don't know, oriental poppies or something like that, you know that they sort of have to germinate within a few months because mm. if they're not going to, they probably aren't going to. Yeah. But, you know, Paris, I know by not experience myself because this is the first time I've actually raised Paris seed, but I know because I've read that everybody else tells you that that seed will take forever to come up. Mm. So I would have left that pot sitting there even for another year or two if nothing had happened. Right. The seed was nice and fresh. John had collected it from his own plant. Oh, I'm giving away the name of my source here. Um, John is a relatively common name. Yeah, well, that's true. So, John, if you're listening. <laughs> uh, Thank you, John. And so he hand pollinated the the flowers he collected the seed he bought me the seed up quite fresh and it's slightly pulpy the seed mm. it was sown immediately it arrived here and then two years later i've got tiny parises they're now going into dormancy i will tip them out of the pot probably sometime during this winter and i'll pull out the little rhizomes and i'll pot them all individually in tubes so not that this is about this plant but how long from this point are these going to be sort of a flowering plant? Another six to eight years. No. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You've got the yeah. patience of a saint. Yeah, well, gardening is about patience. Oh. And I am a great advocate of the slow gardening movement. <laughs> I mean, the slow cooking movement seems to have taken legs and run. We could do the same with gardening. I don't I think slow cooking takes eight years. But anyway, yeah, yeah, well, your lamb would be well cooked in eight years. <laughs> um, there was another tree that we were talking about, the vidia. Yes. And its seed cycle. Yes. Well, this is something we will be doing, I hope, a profile on that particular yeah. tree. There's, in a, there's a few beautiful ones around yeah. here. When it was first collected in China, the seeds are about the size of a walnut. They're quite large. Yeah. They were sent back, I think, to France, and they were sown. Mm. Nothing happened. Mm. So the gardeners in the garden to which the seed had been sent assumed that the seed was infertile, and they threw the whole lot out into the compost pile. Oops. But the next spring, it germinated in the compost pile. So the seed was big enough to cope with the rough and ready treatment that had been given mm. so it does it has to go through you collect the seed you sow it the first autumn goes through the next summer and the next autumn mm. and it will generally germinate the following spring mm. so it will take 18 months to two years before davidia will come up so patience is of the essence with many of these things oh goodness me uh all right well i think we need to actually see some practical seed sowing yes. and just have a look at your potting mix it's Potting mix, it's not seed mix, viewers. All right, yeah. let's have a look. All right, Stephen, well, let's start with the tray. All right, now, I just need to mention, though, I always keep my potting mix separated from the containers in which I'm sowing plants. Yes. If I tip it out on the bench there and then work from there and then sow my seed, I'm potentially going to pollute the potting mix with seed from the previous uh, sowing. So I could end up with, I don't know. Who knows what? Yeah, well, I could end up with my Ace of Pentaphyllums germinating in my Calicarpa Giraldi eyes, which would be a great pain in the neck. So you keep your potting mix separate, and it really is quite literally just a matter of scooping in enough potting mix to almost fill your tray. So what we do is we bring it out here and we try and smooth it out as level as possible. Now, some people suggest tamping down the potting mix with something. Uh, I don't recommend that. I just like to get a nice smooth surface and I do it roughly by hand. And if I had a heap of seed to sow, that's now ready. Now, would you then cover the seed that you have sprinkled on the top of there? All right. Now, that's very dependent on the seed as well. The smaller the seed, the shallower it needs to be Planted. Ah, that's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, in fact, it's a little bit more rule of thumb than that. What is suggested as a rule of thumb is that you cover your seed by twice the diameter of the seed. Okay, I'm not going to do that. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Well, that's basically the rule of thumb. I mean, I pay no attention to that when I'm sowing seed, but I have it sort of vaguely in the back of my mind. I mean, there are always exceptions. I mean, you don't bury a coconut two feet down. Because, in fact, a coconut germinates on the surface. But for most seeds, that's the sort of rule of thumb. Okay, Mr. Ryan, seed planting guru, we've done trays. Let's go into a pot. All right. Well, if I'm going to plant a pot up, it's basically the same principle. You just get your cleanish pot, um, put some potting mix in it. And what I tend to do with a pot is I just 
tap it around the outsides a little bit and that helps you to sort of get a nice smooth surface. So that pot is now ready to sow some seed into. So there we go. Now, again, I wouldn't have my other container nearby. I need a nice blank spot to put it on. I would then write my label. And you poke that into the pot before you start sowing. Because otherwise you could very easily push some seed right down into the bottom of the pot. Sounds silly, I know. And you press it down reasonably far so it's not sticking up too high. Because if you put your arm across your seed trays, you could very easily flick stuff everywhere. Oh, Stephen, so much detail. Well, okay. It's, but it's important detail. Now we're ready to sow the seed. Now, let's say, for instance, sake, we're going to sow our clematis seed. When it's coarse seed like this, I tend to just sprinkle gently by hand. So it's just a matter of making sure it's reasonably evenly covering the pot. So there we go. The seed is actually sown. I then need to cover it. There we go. Now, Stephen, can I just see the, the one that you have just covered? Wow. <laughs> you just, I'm quite, viewers, I'm quite amazed by that. Firstly, it's quite large, quite large bits of, of gravel. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So the seed will easily germinate through it, so that's that's that perfectly is fine. All right. Now I've got a question for you. Yeah. I have planted some things unsuccessfully. Guess yeah. what? And one of the things it said on the packet was to stratify, to put them basically in the fridge. Yeah. In in soil or something, but in the fridge dry, but yeah. in a in a bag. All of which I just find a little annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about stratification. Right. How do you do that? Or do you rely on your climate? I rely on the climate. I haven't stratified things for ages. You don't need to stratify for a long time. So if you are going to try and do it, you need to time it so that you're stratifying just before spring. And should we just explain what it is, yeah. stratification? Yeah, it's basically putting the seed into a medium in a, in a refrigerator, not in the freezer in the crisper. Mm. I actually think that stratification should be done with slightly moist medium. I don't believe it should be dry. Mm. So you might use, um, if you've got pale coloured seeds, you might use a little bit of peat moss. You can then see the seed in amongst the peat moss. Uh -huh. If you've got a um, dark coloured seed, then you might use a little bit of fine sand and mix it through the sand so that again you can see the seed and Good so if, if there's any mildew sets in or anything like that then you need to leap in immediately and sow but if it's staying clean three weeks is normally enough for stratification mm. if you need to do it mm. so because you wanted to germinate after stratification you would do it just before the winter ends in the fridge then out into the uh, potting mix and then out into the shade house or wherever else you're raising your seed. And is stratification only for cold climate plants? Is that why? Because mm. the seeds would drop and go through a cold winter, perhaps under snow yep. and then germinate in spring. And you're exactly right. it. And they need that, uh, I guess, chemical change of temperature. Yep. Yep. That okay. helps to fully ripen the seed. The seed tends to drop off the plant before it's actually fully mature. Mm. So that gives it that chance to ripen. Mm. And of course, the hot water I mentioned before is also something that you do to simulate something that is natural in, in the wild. And the thing that is natural in the wild is not hot water, but heat. And a lot of Australian native plants and certainly South African plants, they're used to a regime of fire. Mm. So the fire comes through, kills the parent plants or knocks them back to the ground. You end up with a bed of ash, the seed drops down into it, it's been heated and therefore the seed will germinate. I don't recommend setting fire to your to seed your trays, house. Uh, but hot water will in fact work in a similar way and in mm. fact take the next step as well because it also hydrates the seed at the same time. All right, now this sort of cousin it tray here, yes. I'm, I'm curious why this is like, you know, in the in the 90s when everyone was having wheatgrass um, smoothies. Yes. Well, Are you growing wheatgrass to sell, Stephen? No, I'm not. Uh, this is actually uh, Kiana Chloe, which is one of the New Zealand alpine grasses, which is a yep. very ornamental grass. Yep. Now, a friend of mine gave me the seed and I had enough seed to sow a whole seed tray, in a tray. of the yep. plant, right? Yep. So I had oodles of it, far more than I'm ever going to sell in one hit. So what I do is I put them into sort of semi or cryogenic state or whatever, um, by not feeding them and pushing them at all, yeah. they'll go into a sort of suspended animation. And if you look closely, you can see that one end of the tray is empty where I've taken out one batch. Yeah. Uh, it's now growing on in um, six inch or 15 centimeter pots. They're nearly ready for sale. Mm. Once they start to sell, I'll take out another 
batch of the seedlings, pop them up. And so instead of sowing it every year over the next two to three years, which mm. in fact I may not have availability of the seed, yeah. I can actually keep reusing the excess plants by just holding them back. Uh, could you do that with many plants or is it just grasses? Or? No, you could do it with quite a lot of plants really. Uh, it's a matter of just making sure that they don't get so poorly that they lose all vigour altogether. The will to live. Yeah, the whole will to live. So that's what I've done with that. So there you go. Interesting. Yeah. And now why have you got this fir tree? I've got a pine tree. A pine tree. Yeah. And it's another little trick I use. If I'm sowing anything that is a conifer, yep. seed thereof of yep. course, I find it beneficial to have the natural mycorrhiza of the conifers in the seed tray or in the pot with the seed when it's sown. Now, I'm all about mycorrhizae yeah. fungi. They're going to save us. It's going to yeah. save humanity. Now, if you look at that, you can see the white fungi growing all the way around oh, the root system. Wow. There's nothing wrong with this tree. It's perfectly healthy. In fact, it's extra healthy because mm. of the mycorrhiza. So what you can do is yeah. you can scrape some of the mycorrhiza off that pot and then put it in with your potting mix before you sow your seed. Now, when you say scrape, how much would you... You don't need much. You just need a little bit of it to go in there so that it will start to grow. Well, over like time. a little fingernail? No, I just... Well, I don't see this as a scientific <laughs> something or another. I just grab a little bit of it, like break square. it up, yeah, and, and put it there. Now, if you haven't got one in a pot like I've just shown you, mm. if you go out to where there's a large conifer growing healthily, scrape the pine needle leaf litter off the surface, grab some of the soil from below, put that into your potting mix. That will also inject oh. the mycorrhiza that you need to help germinate and sustain your baby conifers. That's amazing. So there you go. There's another little trick of the trade. Wow. Okay. All right, Stephen. Well, that was amazing. Oh, I'm I seeing all the things I've done badly and why I've had such terrible failures and some successes. But anyway, mm. all right. So can we break this down to five tips for our viewers then? Number one. All right. Make sure when you collect your seed that you make sure it's nice and ripe on the plant. Number two. Sow as soon as you can and, and practicable. Number three. Make sure if it's a long-term crop that's going to be in the container for a fair while, use a good, strong potting mix as opposed to a seed raising mix. Something I have not done. Number four. Number four, make sure you use appropriate sized containers that are deep enough so that the roots can keep going down uh, so that they're not going to root girdle and, and be a mess too quickly. Number five. Uh, number five is to cover lightly with a coarse gravel that will stop slugs and snails, liverworts and mosses and uh, help with the germination of your plants. And number six. And number six is patience. Oh, <laughs> so patience, the, the, yeah. the Davidia story. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of things will take time to germinate. Don't be in too much of a rush to ditch pots of seed that haven't mm. come up because you never know. Well, I do know that I'm probably not going to wait five years to see the germinate seed, but I'm glad that you are because, you know, the world needs you and yep. professional horticulturists growing rare things that might take five years to germinate. Exactly, because we'll never have them if I don't do the, the hard yard. True, true, mm. true. Well, that has been really fantastic. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing with us your top six tips of growing things from seed. I love that mycorrhizal fungi point. That's yeah. so yeah, Well, that's just an, uh, an interesting little aside. And wasn't it good to be able to do a video in a really bleak day on Mount Macedon oh. undercover in my igloo? Yeah, so apologies for the sound because there's all sorts of things going on externally. But I'm sure you'll forgive us. Well, Stephen, what could we do? How can we top this? You've done propagating by cuttings. You've done propagation by seed. What else could we possibly do? Oh, there's lots of other ways to propagate plants, and we may even have to look at some of those in due course. We might, because you've mentioned root propagation before, yeah. which that's just weird to me. Anyway, but viewers, if you want to know what we're doing next week, hit subscribe. We post every week and follow our continuing horticultural adventure. Stephen, until next week. Goodbye all. See you later.